Psalm 51 or 50, the divine offering, a broken to pieces heart. Trying to reconcile modern scholarly views with ancient Christian interpretations, one can label Psalm 51 as a penitential psalm and for use in sickness. Sickness, regarded as the consequence of sin, see the healing of the paralytic in Mark chapter 2, or of the blind man in John chapter 9, to be healed through divine pardon or forgiveness. But not a bene. Although often it might be the case, sickness is not always a consequence of sin. Just take a look at the book of Job or the protagonist of this book who has never figured out the source or cause of his suffering even after God's long speech. The Christian Bible offers a few reflections on suffering and its possible sources. And all this debate in the Old Testament around the suffering started with that crux interpretum, Genesis chapter 1-2. We have an explanation in Psalm 104.24 where Leviathan, the symbol of evilness, is just an amusement in God's view. In Job chapter 41, Leviathan is a powerful, mysterious beast that only God can overcome it. And in Isaiah 45.7, God is the absolute creator, exactly like in Genesis 1, who can create everything. So he has absolute control over light and darkness, goodness and evilness. But this is the most important in Jesus' view is our duty to take care of those who are suffering. See the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10 or the parable of the rich man and poor Lazarus in Luke chapter 16, to cite only two excellent examples. And just take a look also to the final judgment that I call it the sweet bitter chocolate, where actually we're going to be judged primarily according to the goodness that we had the duty to do it, to those less fortunate than us. According to its superscription, Psalm 51 was written by David after Prophet Nathan's visit. We read in this superscription a Psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone to Bathsheba. The superscription alludes to 2 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 to 13, where Prophet Nathan reproves King David for the adultery he committed with Bathsheba. It's a beautiful story. At the turn of the year, the season on kings go out to battle David and Job with his officers and all Israel with him, and they devastated Ammon and besieged Rabbah. They will remain in Jerusalem. Late afternoon, David arose from his couch and strolled on the roof of the royal palace, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and the king sent someone to make inquiries about the woman. He reported she is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, and wife of Uriah, the Hittite. David sent messenger to fetch her. She came to him and he lay with her. And she had just purified herself after the period and she went back home. It's an interesting uh, artistic representation here by Mark Chagall, but Sheba, where we see King David at the feet of Bathsheba, 
a fallen king, and Bathsheba almost consoling him with the hand touching the king's head. After the adultery sin was committed, Nathan reproves David through a parable, a beautiful parable that we find it in 2 Samuel 12, 1, 7. It says that there was a rich man and had very large flocks and herds, but the poor man had only one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He tended and it grew up together with him and his children. And then the rich man came to the poor man to ask for that lamb. Similarly, David took Bathsheba from her husband, Uriah. A beautiful parable, like I said, found in 2 Samuel 12, 1, 7. But the Holy Writ tells us that adultery was not the only sin David has ever committed. In order to hide his affair with Bathsheba, David arranged that Bathsheba husband, Uriah, to be killed on the battlefield. 2 Samuel 11, 15. As a matter of fact, David was an ambitious individual, a warlord whose violent acts transpired through the 7th, 6th century books of Samuel and Kings, but are completely silent in later books of Chronicles, which don't say anything about David's adultery. In spite of all sins and shortcomings, God called David a man according to my heart. Acts 13, 22, based on 1 Samuel 13, 14. Why such an indulgence on God's part toward David while Saul, the first king of Israel, for not such a mag- mag- big mistake, his unlawful sacrifice instead of waiting for Samuel to sacrifice in 1 Samuel 14 was harshly punished on the battlefield. 2 Samuel 15 seems to offer an answer to this bothering question, to this conundrum. In 2 Samuel 15, we see David like never before, a mere human being, an old, frail, fugitive, humiliated, mocked, yet willing to accept God's punishment without resorting to violence against his enemies. As I mentioned before, he was a violent man, but this time, David was so humble, accepting the punishment of God. We know that Absalom, David's son, has just rebelled against his father, seeking to take his throne. In Bethlehem, just a few miles south of Jerusalem, Absalom plotted a military putsch against David, 2 Samuel 15, 1, 2. Instead of remaining in Zion, his fortress, the Hebrew of Zion means fortress, In crushing his son's rebellion, David covered his head and barefoot, flees Jerusalem, heading for Judah wilderness, getting through the Kidron Valley and climbing the Mount of Olives. Psalm 3 evokes poetically David's flight. David's flight foreshadows or is the type of Jesus' trip, the last trip, from the last supper room to the Kedron Valley and stopping at the Garden of Gethsemane together with his apostles. We see here in 2 Samuel 15 an interesting parallel between David and Jesus. David's flight, as I said, foreshadowing Jesus' trip from the Last Supper room to the Garden of Gethsemane on the Thursday night. Here we see in a Bible, Machevsky Bible, from the year almost 1240, David fleeing Jerusalem. We see David, stop, David here stopping 
his general Abishai, who's about to kill this individual here, Shimei, belonging to the house of Saul, who was mocking the fugitive king. The separating line between Saul and David, what distinguishes Saul from David, why Saul was punished and David was actually labeled a man according to God's heart. The separating line is in how each of these two individuals received the punishment of God, fighting back as Saul or accepting with humility and repentance as David. If 2 Samuel 15 is the narrative of David's transformation, Psalm 51 is the poetry of the same process closely examined by the penitent king. There are three important themes in Psalm 51. Sin and repentance, God's paternal and maternal love, and a well-pleasing sacrifice. The first theme, sin and repentance. Psalm 51 is per excellence a prayer of penitence or penance. Verses 1 to 7 and then verse 9, almost a third of the psalm deals and mentions various types of sin. Transgression or crime, Hebrew pesha, iniquity or injustice, avon, sin, hatat, an evil or bad deed, ra. The list starts with the worst sin, transgression, crime, or pesha, marked by criminal intent and goes down to something very general, bad deed. The emphasis is placed here on the multifaceted sinfulness which dominates the psalmist petitions. A psalmist recognizes his sinfulness by repeating the possessive mind after each sample of sin, my transgression, my iniquity, my sin. Psalm 51 depicts sin as an obstacle between man and God. Once committed sin is always there, quite addictive and resistant to any attempt from human's part to reconnect with God. Here is the word of David. Indeed, my transgressions, I know it, and my sin is always before me. A similar depiction of sin may be found in Genesis 4, 7, where sin is personified and described as a demon, Hebrew robets, deriving probably from the Akkadian word rabitsu and designated an evil demon. And this demon, the sinfulness, has a burning desire, says Genesis 4, 7, after humans to destroy them, of course. But the latter, the humans, says God to Cain in Genesis 4, 7, have the ability to overcome it. How? Genesis 4, 7 answer is by doing good no matter what to others and primarily to the less fortunate. Sin, whatever might be, in David's case, adultery, murder, is an offense against God. That's why David says, against you, O Lord, you alone have I sinned, and what is evil in your sight have I done it. According to the Old Testament paramount view, sin was not forgiven in the Old Testament period, but the rather eliminated from the community on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur in Hebrew, meaning literally 
Day of Concealment or Hiding. We translate it by Day of Atonement, but literally means Day of Concealment. The ritual of Yom Kippur is detailed in Leviticus chapter 16. Their two goats were brought to the temple on the day Kippur, on the day of Kippur. One goat was marked for Yahweh and was sacrificed and its blood was sprinkled over the Ark of Covenant in the Holy of Holies. But the other goat was marked for Azazel, Hebrew Azazel, Septuagint to Apopompeo, for the one who carries away, based on Hebrew etymology, as goat and Azal to go. Leviticus 16, 8, brought in front of the high priest who was lying his hands on this goat, on the live goat, confessing the sins of Israel. Then this goat was dispatched to the wilderness and the confessed sins were discarded in the wilderness, namely concealed, put away, hidden. Kippur devised from kapar, which means to hide, to put a lid away from community. Nota bene, in the apocryphal book of First Enoch 6.13, Azazel, also spelled Azazel, as strong as God, is one of the fallen Nephilim angels who cohabitated with women, conform Genesis 6, 1, 4. Azazel was cast in the wilderness and darkness by the good archangel Raphael. This explains the scribe's consternation when Jesus said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Forgiveness was brought by Christ was not given in the Old Testament times. Sins in the Old Testament times are just covered, eliminated from community, away from community, into the wilderness. But forgiveness was brought by Christ. Or as St. John Chrysostom homily on Easter Sunday puts it so well, forgiveness was dawn from the tomb. In Psalm 51, verse 5, David emphatically states, Behold, in guilt or iniquity, namely entangled in sin, was I brought forth, and in sin, namely as a sinner, my mother conceived me. Hebrew Be'avon and Be'hatat means in a condition of guilt or sin. This does not refer to the parents or conception or birth. Is the intimate relationship between a man and his wife leading to procreation birth of sin? At a quick reading of the text, one can conclude, and many people concluded in the history of interpretation of this text, that sexual relationship is a sin. However, at a closer reading, this text refers to a more sinister reality. It speaks about the entire world. The human life in general has been impregnated, infused by sin since the fall of Adam and Eve and Cain's fratricide, narrated in Genesis 3-4. So what David is saying here is that no one can escape sin because from the very first moments of our existence, from the moment of conception and birth, human being is surrounded by sin. Through conception and birth, we are entering a world which is falling apart, a world full of sin. The psalmist wants to say here that his own personal rebellion goes back to an original scene narrated in Genesis 2-3. Paul in Romans 5-12 says, Through a man, Adam, sin entered the world, and the concept of the original scene emerged. Versus another book, 2 Baruch, circa AD 95, which has a different view on sin. 
Each man is an Adam to himself, says second Baruch. No original sin, but only individual sins. We can see from this contrast that in the first century there were at least two tendencies in the Pharisaic party. One represented by Paul, saying that all our sins are traced back to Adam's sin, to the original sin. And another tendency represented by Second Baruch, writing which says that each man is an Adam to himself and there is no such an original sin. In Psalm 50 is a psalm of penance or repentance, but what is repentance? It is a mere regret for our sins by which we hurt our neighbor and God? Is it a quick promise not to repeat our sinful deeds? It is a strong commitment to change ourselves and re-enter in a new personal relationship with our God? What does scripture primarily, the Old Testament, has to say about repentance? A Hebrew term for repenting is shuv, which means to return. So repenting means returning, but returning to whom? To what? When Israel's prophets like Ezekiel 1830 were using this verb shub, return, they were asking the people of Israel to return to God and his laws, regulations, and relive their lives according to God's will or law. But repentance can mean also return to your past sins and examine the circumstances in which you committed the sin, learning how to protect yourself when a similar circumstance or a temptation will loom again so you will be better prepared with God's help to resist the temptation and not fall again. So in order to go ahead, paradoxically, you need first to go back to return. There is no real progress or advancement, ethically speaking, without this returning to God's will and your own past mistakes for a full examination and careful consideration. We know that both John the Baptist and Jesus began their missions with the same proclamation, repent, because the kingdom of heaven has approached. In the Greek recording of the gospel, we have the verb metanoite, change your mind. But most likely John's and Jesus' proclamation was delivered in Hebrew or Aramaic and sounded like shub, return. If one needs this, if one reads these biblical texts coming from all the New Testaments, in both original language, Hebrew and Greek, using the canonical approach to scripture, one can get the full picture what repentance is about. It is about a process moving from shuv, return, to metanoeo, change your mind. In other words, repentance is a process requiring a return to God and to your own past, along with a thorough examination of your sinful de deeds and a struggle to change yourselves according to God's will. God's design he had when he created us in his image, Genesis 1.27. This full picture of repentance can be found in the parable of the prodigal son, Luke chapter 15, 11 to 32, where the repenting lad returns first to his senses. He came to senses, says the parable. Then he returned to God, to his father. And through God's running love, because we see the father running towards the son when he saw him from a distance. The son is changed then, turning into a royal figure. 
Luke 15, 22, 23 speaks about ring, mantle, sandals, banquet, all are royal insignia or symbols. Second theme in Psalm 50, God's paternal and maternal love. David begins his psalm with, by appealing to God's love and compassion. Be merciful to me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to the abundance of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. There is no return, no change of one's mind, no forgiveness without God's love and compassion. God's love runs supreme over any human effort, struggle, and good intention. There are two key Hebrew words here in this passage describing God's love for human beings. First word is kesed, a key word for the entire Old Testament theology, which can be translated like long-suffering, unconditioned, steadfast love. All the attributes listed here convey the same idea. God's love is like the love of a father who loves unconditionally his children, no matter what will be their response. It is the love of a patient father who waits for his children to realize how much he cares for them. The second important word here is rahamai, meaning compassion. This is the love of a mother who suffers viscerally, rahamayim, derives from the word rechem, which means motherly womb, for her children. One of the, one of the children is sick or hungry or lonely, the motherly entrails are spasmodically moving. They are set on fire. Only a mother can suffer this way. In Psalm 51, one, God is depicted as both father and mother. There are no other places, there are other places in the Old Testament where God takes on maternal and paternal metaphors or imagery. For instance, in Hosea, God is father who liberates his son out of Egypt, Hosea 11.1, 1, and the mother teaching her son to walk in Hosea 11.4. Throughout Psalm 50, David appeals several times to God's love and support so needed for his repentance and renewal. He recognizes that without God's love, he cannot do anything. That's why he says, wash me through and through from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Purge me with eye soap that I may be clean. Wash me that I may be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have crushed may rejoice. And create in me a clean heart, God, and renew a constant spirit within me. The third theme, a well-pleasing sacrifice. We just saw how sin is depicted in Psalm 51 and what repentance is about. We saw also how needed is God's full love, paternal and maternal, for both our return and our renewal in him. But what about human being? Can we offer something valuable to God if our lives since conception and birth are entangled within the thick web of sin? What can a human being offer to God that even he, the one who is the Almighty One, would consider precious and worthy of his full attention? Psalm 51 verse 16 reads, Indeed, you take no pleasure in sacrifice, Zebach, if I were to give it, a burnt offering, Oda, 
you have no delight in it. The psalmist is aware of custom of rendering God things by means of sacrifices like we see in Psalm 22, 25, but he courageously asserts that God does not take pleasure, hafatz, doesn't find any passion in these sacrifices. Similar ideas are found in Hosea chapter 6, 6, Amos 5, 21, Isaiah 1, 11, Micah 6, 6, Jeremiah 7, 21. The man who had the experience of a new life as David had it, created and nourished by God, is reluctant to return to the means of sacrifices to re-enter in communion with God. And that's why this text, Psalm 51, anticipates what Jesus said in John chapter 4, 23. There will be a time when people who are worship God with spirit will worship him in spirit and in truth. David's reflection on sacrificial system culminates with these lines. God's sacrifices Zip hail of him, are a broken to pieces spirit, Ruach Nishbera, a broken to pieces and crushed heart, Leb Nishper Ve Nigde. This you God will not despise. Lotibze. The opening phrase. be also taken as a superlative, the best or the well-pleasing sacrifices, those sacrifices that even God likes. Leb nishper, le nidke, is a completely shattered heart, broken to pieces. A person with such a broken to pieces heart will be incapable to find its wayward direction a full lost person. This type of person, or for this type of person, Jesus came when he said, I came to save the lost ones. So what do you learn from David's statement here? The best sacrifice a human can bring to God is when that person <coughs> is so crushed by the problems of life temptations and trials, then its heart is broken to pieces. But the good news is that God does not despise such a person, and I may add the way for miracles is open right now. We need only to find that kernel of faith deep in our shattered heart and to put all remained from the trust in God. I noticed in my own life that when I experienced the heart's brokenness, God was there to help, and he knew always how to do it. God sees in our extreme humility the ideal offering, and he accepts it as one of the greatest virtues. Saint Ephraim, the Syrian, once wrote, there is no greater virtue than humility because even the almighty God could not do anything without humility. Just take a look at the Ecce Homo, to the suffering Lord Jesus on Golgotha, and you'll grasp the wisdom of this code. Our salvation was worked out through Christ's extreme humility. Juxtaposing now Psalm 51 with Genesis 4, 7, both texts dealing with sin and how humans can get rid of its almost powerful. We can notice that humans have two important ways to resist sin. Doing good to others less fortunate all the time, Genesis 4, 7, and cultivating. Humility as one of the greatest virtues, as Psalm 51 would say. May the Lord of love and forgiveness have mercy on us. Amen.